The following one is a relic from Cricket's past, like most of Cricket. It's a combination of a mercy rule and also something brought into the game to give us more results. And it was so important to early Cricket, as the quality of the various teams was hugely variable, which is why quite often in early Cricket, if you have a look at the scorecards, one team has 11 players and the other one might have 15 or 22 or all sorts of numbers. So the follow on's been with us for a very long time. In fact, the first law was from 1787, but it wasn't quite the same as today. In those days, it was compulsory if you had a lead of any kind to enforce the follow on. After that, it was changed to say if you had a lead of a certain amount, but it was still something around 100 and it was usually automatically enforced. This is the last knot. My dad told me to say this. And there was a reason that cricket did this. We didn't have a declaration at that point. So you had three choices in those situations. Four for your innings, which is a pretty big risk, unless you're Hansi Kronje, as you're now not going to be able to bat in the second innings at all. Or you can bat on and let the wickets fall naturally, or lose wickets on purpose, which was actually a really common thing in early cricket, and obviously not ideal. So the follow-on made sense to move the game forward. But as declarations became part of the game, the follow-ons became optional. At that stage, it became a tactical part of cricket. But you have to remember in some of the lower scoring periods in the early bit of test cricket, a lead of 150 or 100 or 200 was absolutely massive. Also back then, the conditions often played a bigger part. Because we had uncovered wickets, quite often when a team would collapse, it was because of the weather or something had gone on with the pitch. So in that case, a follow on made perfect sense. And realistically, probably until the, I don't know, 1980s, maybe 1970s, maybe 1960s if we're being fair, Test cricket was incredibly lopsided. Australia and England were very good. Occasionally, South Africa were very good, although they obviously didn't play all the teams because of the whole skin colour thing. West Indies were occasionally good. But essentially, Australia and England dominated. So there was a lot of mismatches, and it made a lot of sense. And for a long time in Test cricket, more often than not, teams would enforce. Obviously, it went spectacularly wrong on certain occasions. My favourite is when the West Indies enforced a follow-on against Pakistan in 1958. 319 overs later, Hanif Muhammad at a 970 minute, 337. Beautiful. It's still the second longest team innings ever played in a test match. And obviously it was on a very flat pitch and with an all time great and what would eventually be his career knock. But it is funny to think that it all came after a follow on. And on the follow on, one of the best things to look at is Mike Brearley's book that is used by many people as the Bible of cricket captaincy. In it, Brearley says that there are two main reasons to enforce a follow on. The first is to prevent draws, which in the era of Brearley was a huge problem. And the second is psychological. They're falling apart. Attack! Attack! But Brearley's book was written in 1985. And cricket was played at a different tempo back then. We'd only just gone to the area where everyone had turf pitches that were covered. And yet many of the opinions that are still held by cricket today are from that period because the 80s was such a big moment for world cricket. But there have been quite a few changes since. Like Brearley talks about the draws. And in the years he was writing, some of them had draw percentages of over 50%. In the years when he started his cricket, it was worse than that again. Enforcing the follow-on for that period makes a lot of sense just to get a result. Now the draw rate is under 20%. In fact, some years it's been as low as 10%. So while on some occasions, obviously enforcing the follow-on will help you have less draws, we just have fewer draws than we've ever had before, regardless of the follow-on. What about the psychological? I would assume that that still plays a bit of a part. But also, and you may not know this, but Brearley is a psychoanalyst. So I would assume he would probably rate the psychological a little bit higher than someone like me would. But if there is a psychological impact from enforcing, then there's also an emotional kick from batting on, keeping the team out in the field, really grinding them into the dust, and then setting them a scary high total. If there is psychological damage from enforcing the follow-on, is it more or less than the scoreboard pressure we talk so much about? So if you are talking psychologically, you can see arguments on both sides, really. But let's talk about the physical, because tiredness is a very important thing when it comes to the follow-on. Like my guess is in that game in 1958, the West Indies probably knew it was a fairly flat pitch, but they weren't too worried about tiring out their bowlers. And here's why. That test finished on the 23rd of January. The West Indies bowlers didn't have to play another test for 12 days. In fact, looking at the tests in that series, there were five of them, they were six day matches, and it took 75 days for the entire thing to be played. You know, that's longer than an IPL season. The closest I could find to a back-to-back -back test was seven days rest. Modern players would love that. So even though the bowls from the Caribbean were probably stuffed, they had time. 
And that's another thing that has obviously massively changed in modern cricket. In the current series between Pakistan and Australia, the first test started on the 4th of March. The entire series finishes on the 25th of March. There are less rest days than the gap between the first two tests and that 58th series. And think about it this way. And you only produce so many test bowlers. So running them into the ground is a very stupid thing. Also, we just know more about load management now. Our game is professional. This isn't like the old days where the gentleman captain would find some manual labor bowler to come up, bowl them into the ground, and then go and find another manual labor bowler. We now have sports science, and we're trying to keep our bowlers on the field as long as Jimmy Anderson can stay on the field, and others as well. So from a sports science and fitness standpoint, it's rare that we would actually enforce the follow-up. The times we do will be like the last test of a series, when you're already planning on rotating players for the next game, or the players have had a very long break and they feel incredibly fresh. And then there's the whole batting last thing. 73% of teams decide to bat first when they win the toss in the history of test cricket. There's many reasons for that, and one of those is teams don't like to bat last because batting last is hard. If you enforce the follow-on and the other team happen to make some runs, you end up batting in the worst conditions in that match. When the follow-on was mandatory for a 100 lead, it was, that was so insurmountable at that time that it didn't even make sense for a team to turn it down. Now, 200 runs doesn't feel as insurmountable, and in a series enforcing a follow-on can have huge ramifications way beyond that one game. It's also here worth talking about commentators in golf. Whether it's saying that the declaration too late or that the team should definitely enforce the follow-on, commentators usually go for the far more aggressive option. Part of that is because it's not them who will be embarrassed if a team completes, you know, a hugely unlikely chase. And they also just want to work less hours because all people in the world want to work less hours, right? Most commentators would prefer to be playing golf on day four or, if possible, even on day three than commentating. And they often sway public opinion because they are the people commenting on the game far more than writers or social media. And they quite often sway it away from what is a perfectly sound tactical decision. And we were talking about fitness before, but we we're talking about the fitness of your bowlers. What about the fitness of the opposition bowler? If you're playing back-to-back -back tests, not only do you want to protect your bowlers, but you want to tire out the guys you're facing. Even if it's just a third innings of like 60 overs, that's two extra spells that you have to get out of these guys. Even if they're not putting everything in, they're still having to go out there, lace up their boots, do their warm-ups, mark out their runs, all the things that they'd rather not do. And here I want to sort of mention my unofficial rules for the follow-on. Let's start with how tired your bowlers are. The next is, will not enforcing it limit your chance of getting a result? I always want to factor in how much better you are than the opposition. And lastly, and most importantly, what is the pitch doing? There are plenty of different kinds of collapses in test match cricket. Not all of them mean that you're about to bowl a team out for a second time really easily. There are fluke collapses that don't make any sense even when you go back and look at the footage. There's the collapses that come when every play and miss in one session happens to be an edge. Sometimes they come from a bowler who just has a phenomenal spell. Other times it's just because the opposition bat like idiots for like an hour. And there's so many more variations on that. So the best time to enforce a follow-on is not when any of those things happen. It's because the pitch played a part in it. Because unless the conditions somehow change between you enforcing the follow-on and then batting in the second innings, you're still likely to have a pretty short time to bowl in. And it's actually very common that teams just collapse on a flat wicket or a flattish wicket. There was a test match in Cape Town for 2011 where Australia made 248 in the first innings. Michael Clarke batted beautifully. And in reply, South Africa were 49 for the loss of one wicket. And then the following 19 wickets fell for uh, 96 runs. Both teams collapsed. Then South Africa went out and they had to chase 236 and they did it losing two wickets. In fact, the story that Neil Manthorpe tells me about that is that Gary Kirsten left the ground as coach for the birth of his child with South Africa two wickets down and then came back later in that day and South Africa were two wickets down again, but for a few more runs. So he just assumed that there'd been some rain, not knowing that he had missed two entire innings. But that is just a perfect example of sometimes the fact that teams just fall apart when batting. You could see that recently with India's 36 all out or Broad demolishing Australia at Trent Bridge. It is possible for a very good team to just fold up. But these things don't often happen in consecutive innings. And if you want an even more perfect example of this, how about the 2001 test between Australia and India, Eden Gardens. Australia get a big total in the first innings and India don't bat anywhere near as well and end up more than 200 behind. Australia get excited, send them back in and BVS Laxman, ably assisted by Raul Dravid, sets up an incredible win. But I bring this match up for a very important reason. This is the Adam Gilchrist of follow-on matches. And let me explain what I mean by this. Gilchrist is seen as the big bang of keeper batters 
or batter keepers. But in truth, the game was hurtling towards batter keepers generations before Gilchrist put on the gloves. And the same is true of the Calcutta game when it comes to follow-ons. Because it was so dramatic, and it was only the third time in the history that a team had won after the follow-on was enforced, it's given a lot more importance than it should have in the follow-on world. And here's the main reason that it didn't really affect things as much as everyone thinks it did. The next seven times Australia had the chance to enforce, they enforced. In fact, forget Australia, let's look at the world here for a moment. In the following 31 tests where a team had a chance to enforce the follow-on after the Eden Gardens escape, only six times did teams not do it. It's not that it had no impact, because I think it certainly changed perceptions. But the bigger change wasn't that one game. It was the fact that test series started getting slammed together. As those schedules changed and the pitches got a lot better for batting, teams decided that enforcing the follow-on wasn't worth it. That doesn't really start to show up in follow-ons until 2004. From then until now, there have only been two more occasions that a team has enforced the follow-on than not enforced it. I mean, that's about as close to 50-50 as you can get. And it's not even the only 50-50 thing I found while looking at all the enforcing stuff. As I said before, three sides have lost after enforcing the follow-on. Actually, one side, three times, Australia. But two sides have lost after having a 200-run lead and not enforcing. Well, again, it's South Africa, twice. But one of those games was fixed and had a forfeited inning, so I'm taking that out of the numbers. So there have been 294 matches with a follow-on enforced and 107 without. So regardless of enforcing or not, it means that when you have an enforceable lead, you're going to lose about 1% of your matches. But to go back to Brearley's point, and just to show how much the game has changed since we thought about cricket that way, part of the idea of this law is to allow teams to get more results. But since 2004, there's been roughly as many wins when enforcing when not enforcing. But there's also been 21 draws. And 14 of those was after a team was asked to follow on. And only 7 when they weren't. Put simply... The follow-on is no longer needed to get results consistently. It will still do that in occasional games. And it's also now far less helpful to bowlers than it's ever been. And it was never particularly helpful for bowlers. Teams are winning without it, and most bowlers will tell you that they'd rather not see it at all. But I think it's great that it sticks around, but we have to understand that its usage has changed. The follow-on will remain in our game as this beautiful, weird relic of the past that flips the game on its head midway through. Part mercy, part tactics, and all cricket.